This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Calling to order this meeting of the Amherst School Committee at 6.32 p.m. And I'll start with a roll call attendance. Mr. Demling? I'm present. Mr. Harrington? Present. Um, Ms. Lord? Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer present. Well, Donald present, sorry. And I, I have to adjust my screen again. Uh, Ms. Lord? Short clip Lord how present. to do the basic exercise by Stanley. Thank you. So Amherst is to order. Chair Hall? All right, seeing the presence of a quorum, I'll call to order this meeting of the Pelham School Committee at 6.32 p.m. and start with roll call attendance. Mr. Menino. Menino present. Ms. Kenny? Kenny present. Ms. Barlow? Barlow present. Ms. Stancer? Stancer present. And Hall present. Okay. And I will now call to order the meeting of the uh, Regional School Committee at 6.33 p.m. We'll start with roll call attendance. Mr. Demling? Demling present. Mr. Harrington? Harrington present. Ms. Kenny? Kenny present. Ms. Lord? Lord present. Ms. Seeger? Seeger present. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer present. Ms. Stancer? Stancer present. And McDonald present. I don't see Mr. Sullivan. Does anybody see him? No. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, tonight uh, we'll start with public comment. Um, we have a, a few uh, voice messages that I will play. And um, for those watching at home, the public comment document is um, about 30 pages long and is posted on the arps.org, arps.org website on the Regional School Committee agendas page. Um, and so you can read along the uh, emailed public comment there. Hello, I'm Amrita Vedder. I live in Amherst and I'm a freshman at ARHS. I'd just like to say, please don't cut our school budget. The pandemic has hurt all of us, but one of the groups most impacted is students and teachers. We've been doing all we can to protect ourselves and our community this year, which has made learning very difficult for many students and teaching very difficult for teachers. Please don't put this budget cut on us as well. There are so many other places where this money could come from that would hurt less people. If you take this money from our school, you are hurting all the students at ARHS and all the teachers. And believe me when I say we've already had a pretty rough year. Hi, my name is Laura Drocker, and I'm a Wildwood parent and Amherst resident. I want to thank you all for your thoughtful insights last night and your support of moving towards spring in person learning. I hope we can vote on this quickly tonight and move forward with implementation. Dr. Morris's comments around pragmatism resonated with me, but I was left wondering if we have really been pragmatic enough in our planning throughout the year to allow us to nimbly and quickly move to in person learning. I believe all families at the K-6 level were asked to fill out a non-binding binding survey about intentions for the year this summer. How would those results used if not to group students in all grades as much as possible between remote and in-person and planning bus routes in anticipation of in-person school? Correcting for changes seems less time intensive than the process described last night. I also remember that this summer the state and union agreed to 10 days of extra time this school year to train and prepare for in-person school. I assume that we used those days in early September for that purpose and therefore we should be just reviewing information now. I support the comments from several members of the school committee last night that we need to move safely but quickly to get students back whenever we can. One and two week delays for the sake of consistency are too long at this point in the process. I am also very happy to see a move towards decisions about the mode of education being made by input from public health officials and with Dr. Morris. This has been a common ask from parents since the summer. 
However, making that final decision now about high school with nearly four months of the school year left does not seem in line with that plan, particularly given the announcements yesterday that all adults should have a shot by May and this morning that all teachers are now given priority. A lot can happen in a month and we need to be identifying decision points and pragmatically planning for several scenarios, continued remote, but also different types of hybrid openings, assuming it may be safe to do so. There are several examples of high schools in hybrid modes in surrounding towns. Can we learn from them? What has worked well and not reinvent the wheel? Or maybe ask the students to provide input on what they would like to see happen if the situation allows, giving them more autonomy in this decision. My colleague in Natick has a high schooler who has been in hybrid mode since last fall, since the fall. Dr. Morris may have been alluding to this situation last night because early on students were caught partying unsafely and not cooperating with contract tracers. As a result, the principal moved the school remote for two weeks and canceled all activities, noting clearly that in-person school was a privilege that could be lost. That was successful in getting students to play by the rules, and they have had no additional shutdowns at the high school since, and no in-school transmission. Let's use this as an opportunity to put pragmatism into practice, be nimble and innovative in our approaches if the science allows, and let our older students step up to take more responsibility. I do not support voting to keep some students remote because it is easier than Hi, this is Alicia Reed, and I'm an Amherst resident. Uh, I'd like to first start by thanking the school committee for putting forward this motion. And as someone who appreciates hearing hard data, thanks also to Heather Lord for taking the time to tally and report that nearly two-thirds of families have informally requested the option of in-person learning. Overall, I'd like to comment that I'm really not only in this effort for my own children, and I'm happy to see Pelham students go back on a faster timeline, if at all possible. I do want to raise a question, though, about Dr. Morris's proposed timeline for returning students to in-person. It seems that phase one students could return everywhere very quickly, given that they were already matched with teachers, the classrooms have been prepared, et cetera. The MLA requires that teachers be given notice of five to ten working days for returning to the building. At Crocker Farm, we received a call to return on February 22nd and had students on buses and in classrooms one week later on March 1st. I'm therefore having some difficulty following why phase one students couldn't return to all schools in March, followed very shortly after by grade two and up. Looking at the MOA, six weeks are planned between phase one and three students returning. We're now supposedly working on an expedited timeline that will take seven and a half weeks from today for all students to return. That doesn't sound especially expedited. I and others were also baffled by why families submitted non-binding surveys in the fall, only to hear last night that everyone has an equal chance of meeting the switch teachers. It sounds as though we have student teacher parents that were never set up to move to in-person. That said, I do recall our bus driver stating in October that my fourth grader would eventually share a seat with my kindergartner, so it seems there was some consideration of later phases when preparing bus routes. I hope that Dr. Morris can clarify for us is it the case that some changes are being anticipated to in-person classes and bus routes that were already prepared for all students in the fall, or is it that no planning occurred at all in the fall beyond phase one, and this is a brand new process? Finally, I deeply respect and will defer to Emma Dragon's perspective, but was troubled to hear that there are no plans for high school students to return at all. We know that Northampton, Beltrytown, Hampshire Regional, and others are successfully running hybrid models for their high school students. No school is able to cohort high school students in the way that the lower grades are cohorted, but maintaining distancing has been sufficient to mitigate transmission in many schools. I wanted to therefore raise whether it's possible to put the planning in place so if the situation improves from Emma Dragon's perspective, high school students could potentially return to buildings this school year. It seems we've been relatively flat-footed in our planning, and I would welcome seeing planning put in place for high school students, even if they may only get one month together in the building. Thank you. Thank you to the school committee for your service and efforts to balance the diverse needs of families in the district. I'm speaking on behalf of several families. We are writing with concerns about the proposal to introduce the hybrid model at the middle school. The CDC guidance released this week recommends full-time remote learning for middle and high school students in areas with 100 or more new cases per 100,000 people. It emphasizes the need for testing to catch asymptomatic cases is shifting to hybrid learning. 
The district's weighted case rate on Wednesday was 164.7. The CDC has also warned this week that continued caution in the next couple of months is critical to containing the virus. With this in mind, we ask the school committee to do three things. Number one, ask the district to survey families to find out what percentage is actually interested in hybrid learning at the middle school before designing the model. It is important to preserve what is working well for middle, many middle school families now. As part of a survey, demographic data is needed to ensure you are hearing from a representative group. As Dr. Morris indicated last night, Typical numbers across the country and reflected in the arts fall data indicate that one half of middle school families are choosing to stay remote. Across the country, reports have also shown that families of color are disproportionately choosing remote learning. Having sound data before settling on models is integral to ensuring the best balance of education this spring. Number two, Grant administrators, educator staff, and the educator planning group that Principal Sharon proposes flexibility in both the timing and structure of any introduced hybrid learning model. This is important so that priority can be given to those students most in need and disruption to the current high quality education can be minimized. The summary provided by Dr. Morris at last night's school committee clearly reflected the capacity of the district to develop and implement excellent plans. He also talked about the importance of taking time to do things right. It will take longer to properly design a model for the middle school, particularly given that students rotate through multiple classes, the teachers teach in a team model, and that it is critical to respect remote assignment commitments made to teachers and staff who for personal reasons need to remain remote at least to the end of the year. Number three, incorporate the intent of Dr. Morris's statement from last night into the April in-person return motion that is up for a vote this evening. He said, quote, it is important to me that families who want to stay remote have the same high quality remote education that they have had, end quote. This is necessary to ensure that medically vulnerable students and families do not find themselves in punitive circumstances. We ask for the addition of language that confirms that remote, robust remote learning will continue as currently offered and with minimal disruption to students' classes, teachers, and schools. Just as a note, uh, Google Voice um, actually automatically cuts people off at three, at the voice messages off at three minutes. So that is not me uh, cutting them off mid sentence. Hello, my name is Ryan McCarthy, and I'm an Amherst resident. I want to thank the school committee for presenting this motion to resume in-person learning. And I also want to thank Dr. Morris for the detailed description he gave last night. Although both my children are in elementary school and will, and will be returning to in-person learning, I have to say that I was saddened to hear that there's no plan for the high school students to return to in-person. I'm a high school special education teacher in a public school here in Hampshire County, and I've been teaching students in person since September. Our entire school has been using a hybrid model for months now, teaching around 70% of our students in person at least two days a week with at-risk and special populations accessing the building four and five days a week. Because of, this, because of the success we've been having at the shared end of the shared belief that access to in-person learning is important for our high school students, our district school committee just voted this week to increase from two to four days per week for all of our students that choose to learn in person. Um, both of my younger brothers are also high school teachers and have been teaching in the hybrid models in their eastern Massachusetts schools since September. Across all three of our schools, there has never been an instance of in-school transmission. There have been concerns about outside, uh, sorry, there have been concerns about out-of-school behavior in one of our districts, but never an instance of in-school transmission. Although I and many others will continue to teach high school students in neighboring districts, I would hate to see our district continue to be an outlier in this way. Although some might not be comfortable resuming in-person learning for the high school right now, we owe it to our students to find a way to make this happen. If other neighboring districts have been able to successfully navigate the complexities of in-person learning at the high school level, I know that we can too. Again, thank you so much for all of your hard work, time, and dedication to doing what's best for our children. I'm sharing the public comment document. And as I mentioned earlier, this is available on the arps.org website on the Regional School Committee agendas page um, for folks that would like to read on their own or at their own speed. 
Um, are you seeing this, this document on the screen? Okay, so I will scroll somewhat quickly.
Um, as mentioned, that uh, document is uh, posted on the ARPS website um, on the agendas page of the Regional School Committee. So um, welcome to read it later. Um, I seem to always forget uh, neglect to note at the beginning of our meetings that this meeting is being recorded and it is live streamed. Um, thank you, Amherst Media. It is um, being streamed on channel 15 in Amherst as well as online on amherstmedia.org. Um, our next order of business, um, we don't have minutes to approve tonight, and um, so we will move um, right into the superintendent's update. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Morris. Sure, I'll just mention one brief thing. I'll make some, if it's okay with the chairs, I'll make some brief comments at the beginning of the, the next agenda item, but this one feels like it um, could fit in either, but I've, I'd rather slot it here. Um, so today, uh, for those who didn't see, there was a press conference with Governor Baker, a lot of people were there as well, talking about vaccination for teachers, and it's caused a whole, whole bunch of confusion. Uh, so I want to see if I can clarify, because I've gotten a significant number of phone calls and emails about this today. So what the governor... Um, stated was that uh, next Thursday, which is uh, the 11th of March, that um, school personnel, not just kind of educators, because sometimes that gets mixed up, but anyone who works in a school will be eligible to um, try to sign up for a vaccination. So there's a lot of feedback I've gotten that believe that on March 11th, all educators in Massachusetts are getting vaccinated. I want to be really clear that that's not true. Um, that that's the beginning of when they're able to log in on the state system. Uh, and try to get an appointment. Governor Baker was really clear that there's a backlog. I believe the number he said was 600,000 people who are eligible who have not yet gotten a vaccine. There's 400,000 people uh, who work in schools in Massachusetts. Uh, daycares, right, you know, it wasn't just, you know, public schools, it was kind of anyone working in, in education. And so that's going to be a million people uh, slated to try to get a vaccine. And I believe the number, and I didn't write this down, so I apologize, was, was either 150 or 175,000 uh, doses that they're receiving a week. Um, so it's good news, but I want to be really clear that it doesn't mean that educators um, in mass, uh, at least there's no plans that I've heard for educators in mass uh, to be vaccinated uh, on March 11th, or really that there's the capacity at the state level. And he emphasized this many times in the press conference, those who didn't watch it, uh, to be that that they're that they're going to get through this grouping the 65 plus two or more comorbidities comorbidities and educators that total a million people um particularly quickly and he cited that it's it's really due to the supply issues uh, their bands there in the state but the supply side uh they're not anticipating a significant increase in supply in march they were hoping j and j the johnson and johnson vaccine would be more readily available and uh, I think in time, he said that would happen, but not this month um, to make a huge dent. Um, so I think I'm really excited that, you know, educators can be in the queue. He referenced loosely perhaps some educator clinics at sites, but there were no details offered on that. And and again, um, I'm going to sound like a broken record because he sounded like a broken record about the supply being the problem. It's not that there's not a desire on the state side to have educators be vaccinated. Um, but with the current supply that Massachusetts is receiving, um, they're going to have a hard time moving expeditiously, expeditiously through uh, the current groups that are eligible as well as the school groups that are eligible. On a more positive front, you know, last week we did find out, and, and Faye Brady sent this out to folks, that a number of school personnel were eligible even before this new information, school counselors, folks involved in school mental health, some OTs, um, a number of uh, kind of folks related to special education uh, were deemed eligible. The state let us know that. And, and um, so I wanted to share that. So, you know, I hope that this expedites educators being vaccinated. I've been very public multiple times, as has this committees, that we think that's a good thing to, to make that vaccine available. We know that that's one of the uh, strongest measures around supporting um, safety for everyone. And it's not just about educators. Actually, the more people that vaccinated in the community, that'll influence transmission rates, which then influences what happens in school. So we think it's a good thing, uh, but I don't want there be, I think there's a little um, optimistic responses towards that announcement that sort of like, oh, by the you know third week in March, all the educators will be vaccinated. Uh, the governor made no commitment that educators would receive their first shot in the month of March, the month of March which I know that, uh, President Biden yesterday said he hoped for. Um, uh, didn't commit to. Um, so 
I don't want to put be a negative person, but I actually, you know, if you watch the press conference, it was perhaps less rosy than some of the reporting, uh, informal and formal reporting on that. I think the other thing that, um, you know, so I think the devil's going to be in the details. We'll have to see, you know, do they have ex- educator only clinics and where is that coming from? And, and we'll, we'll only know how that is in time, but I think it's no surprise to anyone who's watching this or on this call that uh, the website's been an issue, that demand is far out stripping supply and that it's hard to get an appointment even if you're in one of the groups that is uh, in the queue as educators will start being. I got a number of questions today from staff members and community members of could the town of Amherst just set up a clinic for educators? Uh, so I want to answer that one because I'm getting so many questions about that. So kind of there's two ra- two reasons why at this point I did talk to uh, the health department prior. I re- recall them again today to make sure I was understanding it correctly. And the first reason is at the current time, uh, sites like ours, our one that's in the bank center and has been in the high school, can't work independently with uh, a specific agency and exclude members of the public, that they're open for all members. Um, and, and that's sort of the commitment they make. So if the state does something different with vaccination sites, you know, or days specific for educators, that'll be different. But our site has a commitment to be open for all residents actually in the Commonwealth. It's not just Eastern Hampshire County anymore. The second reason is that they're currently getting a supply of less than 300 doses a week. Um, Their appointments run out less than 10 minutes. Every time they open a new appointment, it's gone within 10 minutes. And so their capacity, we have about 500, 600 staff members. Their capacity, you know, it would be that they would theoretically have to close for two weeks to only work with one district. Um, You know, it's just not a practical reality for them. None of this is to suggest that I haven't tried, I haven't called, I haven't worked on this as much as I could. Uh, you know, and again, I, I apologize to disappoint uh, folks who are eager to get vaccinated as I am excited for them to get vaccinated. Uh, but I, I, I do think there was a bit of um, wishful thinking that I saw uh, out there today. And I feel like my obligation is to, you know, in my consultation with public health officials to be able to share back with the community. And even just hearing Governor Baker's speech, as opposed to what was reported or the headlines I saw in the paper, um, that, you know, there was no indication that vaccinations would be available for all school personnel uh, in the next two weeks, right? You know, I think I think he actually squashed that comment pretty quickly in the conversation. So is it good that educators will be eligible abs- next week? Absolutely. Uh, will it have an appreciable impact in the short term? I think um, I think there's a lot of questions about that. Individually, may it have an impact? Sure, but but you know, on a large scale, um, he gave every indication that that it's going to take a while, uh, and he gave the data and the numbers to show that. So this isn't an anti or pro governor statement or anything like that. But I, I do think there's been uh, I think a lot of confusion that's been created today, and I think um, the last thing we need these days is confusion. And so I wanted to you know perhaps negatively in terms of the impact, but just share what I know. Uh, We shared all of this information with the JLMC group. You know, there was a press release that came out from the governor about vaccinating educators. We sent that to all staff this afternoon. We are trying to be as transparent as possible and sharing all the information we get with our bargaining unit, uh, bargaining units, as well as with all of our staff members. And as this develops, if this educator only clinics in certain regions, we'll be sharing that immediately with their educators. We want our educators to get vaccinated, right? There's, There's no there's no uh, there's no question about that, uh, but we are not a vaccination clinic ourselves. We're, the district cannot be one at the moment, uh, and we're just trying to work to get our our staff members the most accurate information so um, they have the most access possible. So sorry to be uh, a Debbie Downer on that one, but but um, you know I think overall good news. I think the impact's going to be a lot more graduated than um, than perhaps the headlines indicate. You know, the March 11th thing is really dece- deceiving because people are like, oh, they see that date and they assume that, oh, there will be 400,000 slots available on March 11th for all educators in the state to sign up because I think it's been kind of framed that way. But, you know, Governor Baker certainly indicated that would not be the case. We're not getting 400,000 doses a week in general in the state. Um, so that's just not going to happen. I'll hold my other, I mean, I'm happy to answer any other questions on vaccines. But since we let la- met last night, I don't have any other <laughs> superintendent updates, but... <laughs> Um, but I just, uh, wanted to share that, you know, we're doing our, our best to share accurate information with our staff and community, um, which is a challenge in these days as we've all experienced multiple times. Does anybody have any questions? 
for Dr. Forrest. I should also just thank uh, Representative Dom, who's been a great help in communicating with, with, with the bargaining units, with myself, with our team here. Um, she's been fabulous and just want to publicly thank her for uh, bridging between the district and then uh, her work at the legislature and the executive, executive branches of, of government. It's been a huge help and yeah, you know, thank you very much, Mindy. Thank you. If there's no questions, then um, move to um, the chair's update. <clears throat> and I have a couple things. Um, one is this a uh, repeat of last night's update, but just uh, knowing that folks are watching at home um, next week will be the regional school committee is meeting. Um, the agenda item that was not um, discussed last night is going is pushed to next week, which is pooled testing, as well as um, our budget hearing. And I know there's a lot of interest in the community in that. So um, the 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 way to participate in the budget hearing is the same as with public comment for any of our regular school committee meetings. Um, submit an email to myself. Um, uh, I ask that you note either in the subject line or in the first line of your email that it is for the budget hearing, as well as voice messages to the Google Voice phone number that's um, in, on the agenda. So that is next Tuesday at 6.30. My other update is that I joined this afternoon, actually right before this meeting, I joined Dr. Morris and Ms. Cunningham, the assistant superintendent, in an informal meeting with um, some members, three members of the APEA executive board, um, to listen to their ideas and questions with regard to a spring return to in-person learning. They had, um, it was about an hour long meeting, they had lots of good questions that they fielded from their members um, across the board. Um, and they shared some ideas for ensuring a safe return, um, as well as planning for more outdoor learning opportunities. Um, so the hope, um, the plan, actually not just a hope, um, it is a plan um, to continue these and, and schedule another one. Um, I do have, I did check um, in with our attorney to make sure um, that, you know, to, um, guide the approach to that meeting and his advice is as long as it's a listening session and not sort of a negotiation or discussion about topics direct or you know sort of representing opinion of the school committee um, it is not it is fine to have these informal meetings with a small group um, that said he also advised that if there's another school committee member that would like to join me at one of these um, at, at this next uh, listening meeting, um, that is also fine. So please, um, if any of you are interested, send me an email um, at, from the regional school committee. Um, that, just send me an email and we'll include you um, in the planning for that, for setting that next meeting up. Any questions? Mr. Demling. There was a news report that the APEA executive board asked our committee to postpone our vote tonight. Uh, is there any update on that? Did that come up in the conversation? Um, it, it did not come up in conversation. I had, when they, um, when I received an email requesting this, this informal meeting, um, that was when they requested the postponement of the vote and I responded that we could not. And it did not come up in discussion again tonight. And as I would say, I, I, Dr. Morse was there as well. I don't know if you want to add anything, but I will say that the meeting was um, was productive, um, and the questions were were not really about the vote, but really about how are we going to ensure a safe return and more sort of mechanics and sort of re, you know, as we were experiencing last night, um, going through the fire hose of all of the work and planning that we had talked about over the course of many months in the summer and the early fall. Um, a lot of the questions were really sort of digging back and, and confirming some of the things, um, questions about sort of changes to anything that may have happened since um, to that plan. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I thought it was a very productive conversation. And I think that collaborative problem solving model is a really good one um, to get established and to continue moving forward. So, you know, appreciate your participation, Ms. McDonald. It's not like you have a shortage of meetings. Uh, to attend, as well as Ms. Cunningham, who's just incredibly knowledgeable on the HR personnel side, which is, you know, clearly in this context is going to be critically important, and she's our expert in that area. 
And then the APA members for their participation, bring great questions and collecting questions from staff members so that uh, they could then uh, be communicating back uh, information. So, you know, really just productive and hopefully the start of, uh, of more kinds of uh, continued uh, collaborative problem solving. Uh, and we have other examples of that, but this felt, um, you know, just appreciate everyone's presence and, uh, and appreciate your leadership on that, Ms. McDonald. And one, one comment I will share is, um, that stood out for me was the, the comment that members really are trusting of the JLMSC. And so I think that that also is, a, is an effective model for, um, for problem, collaborative problem solving as you, as you coined it, Dr. Morris. So kudos to our team on the JLMSC. Okay, um, next up is school committee announcements. I know that it's been a you know, long 24 hours since we last saw each other. So um, I don't know if there's any other, if anybody has any announcements to share. Not seeing any, so we will move on to our um, single item of business, which is um, the uh, re continued discussion of our return to in-person learning for spring 2021. Um, and the idea of tonight is to move to a vote if we can. Um, we processed and, and heard a lot of information on the sort of specific details of how that might happen. Um, and we've heard a lot of comment in both last night and, and tonight. Um, so uh, I think tonight um, would be, and I, I heard you say, Dr. Morse, that you had a few comments that you wanted to add. Um, and I would just remind folks that for of context um, that we, this is coming, we've committed to full-time in-person learning for the fall and the context of, of that was the the recent advice that we just received from our attorney based on the decision in melrose that the metrics and decision framework section of our moa is not enforceable um and so the uh and i shared the 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 um document of the specific letter from the attorney yesterday um with the school committee members um and the one and, and actually this relates to the meeting with the APEA. The one uh, thing that the attorney did note is that all other parts of the MOA are, are enforceable. All those, the um, about six foot distancing, PPE, and all and all of the other um, safety protocols that we have agreed and settled in that MOA are still enforceable. That was a question um, that the uh, executive board members that we met with this afternoon wanted to hear as well. And so I think it's important to state that again, that those those are enforceable and we are um, still honoring those. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Morris, before we get started. Oh, uh, I see a hand. Ms. Seeger? Yeah, uh, just a question for Dr. Morris. I know he's gonna give some comments. Could you please recap the timeline of opening for all the grades again? Um, as you talk, or at some point. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to try to run down uh, why. I, yeah, I will. Uh, that's okay. I'll do it in context. I think it'd be better than answering and then jumping into it if it's okay with you, Ms. Seeger. So, so a couple introductory comments. I'll get into some more details. So, I think one, you know, I want to acknowledge and recognize the urgency that families have because they're, you know, many of them are uh, seeing it uh, mightily. Uh, as it relates to our current model. So, you know, I, I don't want to say what I'm going to say uh, as um, anything other than we want to do this well. Um, but, you know, I do feel the urgency that families feel. And, you know, I think I have to balance that between what we think is feasible to be done uh, and support all of our students. Um, and so, you know, I, I can't hear that level of public comments and, and, and not respond to it and it really acknowledge the pain that people are experiencing on a daily basis. Uh, some people are experiencing a daily basis. So I want to start with that framing. Um, and I want to go through a little bit of what some of the challenges are. Um, you know, some of this also comes on the heels of uh, a DESE decision that's slated to be made on Friday, seems likely to be made, frankly, on Friday, and then some legal decisions that occurred a couple of weeks ago, right? So yes, we've been planning for this. And then the reality of it in terms of identifying students and staffing and all those pieces is a dynamic situation. Uh, so a month ago we were having, we're all here, we were having a really different conversation than the conversation we're having right now. Um, so I think it's important context. Um, 
The second thing is we did survey families in the fall. Um, and what we've seen already with even a volunteer return is a pretty significant delta or change of what families told us either in a binding survey at the primary grade levels or a non-binding survey, uh, particularly the non-binding survey at the upper grade levels or the intermediate grade levels at the elementary level. And um, so I think these aren't changes around the edges. We're seeing pretty significant shifts, uh, literally, and, and frankly, going both ways. We've heard from families who felt much more comfortable the fall because, frankly, the numbers were lower in September than they are right now, both nationally and statewide. And we're also seeing families who've made a different shift, that they have they've feel like they're, their children have been in distance learning long enough and more science is known on the topic and they're more comfortable. So the data we have that's old is, uh, is not of great use. When you have enough people who already in our um, voluntary return have shifted their opinions on matters, um, you know, those changes are going to be significant. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and remembering that those surveys were taken, you know, six months ago or seven months ago, um, a lot more is known and a lot of experience have, a lot of families have had different experiences. Some hardships have been faced by families. We have families who have lost family members to COVID and, and nothing will probably make you think differently than losing a family member. Uh, and other families who have had different experiences. So I want to really be sensitive to families that we're going to be asking them if you vote tonight. We're going to be asking elementary families tomorrow for a binding choice. Uh, we'll have some optional sessions, you know, uh, for families to get more information if they're unsure of their choice. And for some families, this is absolutely an easy choice about return or they want to stay remote. And there's a non, a not insignificant number of families who this is going to be a gut wrenching choice for. Um, that when you're making a non-binding response, it's pretty easy to make an answer. When you're talking about sending your kid to school in a um, in a pandemic. It, it's it's not as easy as it is. And, and I think it really gets to something I said last night. Everyone has experienced this pandemic really differently, right? There are other themes, yes, but individual situation has really determined how people have experienced it. We have family members, and I'm not trying to be dramatic, but literally we have family members, we have uh, staff members, families who have lost multiple family members uh, to COVID. We have other people who have been relatively directly uh, unscathed uh, in them and their immediate family. And so I think we just have to recognize the range of experiences is really wide. Uh, not everyone's going to come to a public meeting and share those comments. And so non-binding surveys feel easier to answer in, a, in September than a binding survey, given that we're a year into the pandemic. So, you know, I just, I, I want to acknowledge that when families change, this actually came up today at one of our school staff meetings, our elementary schools, that we want to really encourage families that the choice they made in the fall should have no bearing on the choice they make now. In other words, it's not, we ask non-binding and if someone changes their mind, there's no penalty for changing your mind from what you said in September or October. There was some feeling in one of our schools that, you know, families might be reticent uh, because it shifts some of our planning. And we really want families, you know, in the next week, frankly, to make the choice that they think in March is going to be the best for them for the rest of the school year. Um, and that's not easy. So I want to just acknowledge those factors as being very real. I know we're hearing from a lot of families who feel really certain of they're either not going to send their child to school or they're going to attend child school. I hear much more in principals do from families privately who are really uncertain. Uh, and, that, and, and that's a big number out there. A uh, couple other things I wanted to share um, that in terms of transportation routes, we do have many families who will rely on bus transportation to get their child to school. Uh, we can't expect that all families will drive their children or that carpooling will work for all families. And small changes make large impacts on routes. So, you know, we are not moving to the DESE model um, that they at least proposed of filling our school buses, right? The elementary schools technically in Massachusetts, one could fill the school bus, you know, we're not comfortable with that. Um, so if we're gonna cap the number of kids in a bus, a delta of five students might completely change two routes, right? If you can't fit on one bus and we're shifting, then it, it's not uh, it's not easy. Um, and and uh, Ben has seen me down there, and uh, you know uh, you think you can make that one change. And once I ask someone whose name is Sally to click a button, lots of bad things happen. Uh, and I can tell you that because we've looked at it for the school start, and I was looking at Shutesbury and Leverett bus routes and. Well, can't that bus go right? And and there's a reason why we have talented professionals who do this and use high high level software. And that, like when I walk in the room, ten minutes later when I walk out, I realize that I've wasted ten minutes of of Sally and and Randy's time. And I'm not saying that to be flip. It's just it's really complicated until you actually get in the weeds of it. It's not something that can easily be put together. And we know families rely on transportation or, or buses to get there, and we have to be right. 
we can't make mistakes during a COVID era. So, you know, that usually takes about a month uh, to work on all the bus routes, school year ends, people work on it. We feel pretty good by the end of July, beginning of August, and then we, we cross-reference them. Uh, and that's in a normal year where we're not limiting our transportation to a small group of students. We're not assigning seats to, to students and we're not doing all those pieces. Um, so, it, you know, I wish it didn't take as long as it takes and yet there's a reason it does and it's, it's promoting safety and transportation is frankly the most dangerous part of our day and will continue to be even in a COVID era, transportation will be the most dangerous part of our day. And that's something we really need to be get right. Now, I want to talk a little bit about academic programming and why that takes a little longer. You know, so we have over 20% of our students receive special education services at the elementary level, over 10% of our students are English language learners. Um, and we now have two tracks. And those are English language learners and special education students will be on both sides of those tracks, the in-person, the virtual. We know that. And so for our ELL teachers, our special educators, um, the way we do it as efficiently as possible is we group students with similar needs together to work with our talented special education and ELL group. When we have students virtually and in person simultaneously, our groupings need to be completely reorganized and redone so that we're not only doing it ethically and morally, but we're actually meeting the letter of the law of the services that students are uh, legally required to obtain. So it's not just putting students in classrooms. I mean, that, that feels easier uh, when you start looking at the complexity of how we deliver services in our district, you see that having two parallel tracks, not knowing who's going to be on them until a week from now and then reorganizing that will take a while. Placement and all that work happens all spring in a typical school year uh, for the next school year. We, we dedicate significant amounts of time and energy to that at the elementary level, and we're going to do it in a very contest, condensed time frame. Um, additionally, we're going to hire, need to hire people. I said this last night. Um, not sure. I was surprised it made the paper as the headline, but it's the truth, I guess, um, that we are going to have to hire more people. And we have high standards for our staff members in this district. It's not exactly hiring season, so to speak. So again, we're going to look internally as best we can. Um, but if you told me tomorrow, could you run school? If we had all the information, we had all the bus routes, we had everything magically was, you know, in my office on a flash drive we would not have the adults we need to operate school tomorrow in a parallel track of in-person and remote. Um, so we posted positions you know, this week. We're gonna post more positions as we find out uh, next week what, we, what families are doing. But the reality is we, we have to onboard staff and onboarding staff in COVID is, is gonna take more time and it's time well spent because of students' education as well as health and safety. Um, we have staff, staff members who have medical conditions that at this time precludes them from work. That's a dynamic list. We have staff who had medical conditions and have returned to work on a voluntary basis or have chosen to return uh, because their situation has resolved. We have staff members who have developed, uh, and I won't say medical, but health-related uh, needs to have remote assignments. And so that also, we have that list and it's dynamic. It changes um, and matching the number of students, the number of staff members is gonna be a challenge. I hope it works out where, um, you know, the best way possible and the most efficient way possible. But if we're saying we want, and I, th I think we should, that any student who wants to come can come, uh, and we want to make sure we're protecting the health and medical needs of our staff members, there's going to be mismatches where we need time, take time to address them. Um, and that is going to be just the reality. We also have many students at the elementary level who are going to change classes, uh, regardless of whether it's students choose in person or remote. My estimate, it's a big range, it's gonna be about a quarter to half of students uh, have some staff member who changes for them. Uh, we don't take that lightly at this time of the year. We have staff, this happens all the time. Staff members go out, you know, someone has a, a child in their family. Uh, there's leaves that happen, not at this level of scale. Uh, and we've been through this a little bit before, not this acutely, but I was here in 2010 as a principal where we 40% of students shifted schools. Granted, that wasn't just teacher, but that was school. And why it worked is we provided time for educators to get together, talk about student learning profile, uh, make connections with, with students, and make that transition work both for the in-person, in this case, and the remote students. And I think rushing that process and assuming that students and teachers who don't know each other, don't have information about each other, can naturally just go like it's day one uh, in April, I think is, is, is not the way we do things. I don't think that's taking care of students. And it's we want our staff members and students to be as prepared as they can be uh, before transition. Um, so I, you know, I, I get the comments uh, that are pushing for quicker, but I wanted to explain at least a, a bit of why it's not feasible in my estimation for 
uh, large scale students to return this month. Uh, I wish it was the case. It'd be better for students if we could do that. But I think because of the, the, the needs of our students, the transportation challenges, the logistical challenges, and the time that we also have to train staff. So, you know, we did have days in September for training. Uh, if you get trained in something seven months ago, I don't, you know, something as serious as COVID uh, and, and working in a building, and I've never done it before, which is true for most of our staff members, they're going to need some training. And we do have that scheduled uh, and dates and times scheduled for that. Uh, but that's going to be critically important too. We want our staff members to feel as comfortable and confident when they return to buildings, because that's going to lead to comfortable and conf confident students being in buildings. Um, teacher sneezes, this is not a medical, but you know, teacher sneezes, everyone gets a cold. That's not a medical piece. It's just if the teachers are feeling more anxious because they haven't been given time and information about their students, that's not in our students' best interest, right? Um, and things have changed, like contract tracing. We have different protocols than there were protocols in the fall. Um, you know, teachers' ability to be asked about individual students. This came up in conversation Ms. McDonald referenced earlier. Um, some of the rules and regulations have shifted uh, since the last time we were having these conversations uh, and we need time to train our folks. Um, so, you know, I'm open to anything the school committee, right? It's, it's your decision on the timeline. I wanted to frame that. I want to talk just a little bit about middle school, high school, and then I'll, I'll really give time for the committee. So at the middle school level, I had great conversation today, conversations today with Principal Sharon, and uh, we do plan to survey families sooner as opposed to later. Um, one of the things that that he and his conversations, even just initial conversations with the educators in this building was, you know, at that level, you sort of need to know the yield before you can plan the program. You know, there's got to be some parameters. But um, so, you know, we, we talked about within the next week, week and a half, uh, sending a survey out to families, knowing that we won't have the full programming model, uh, but we will have, an, you know, the piece around two days a week. Uh, once we get that feedback from from families, we then can build the program out from there. So, you know, sooner as opposed to later, uh, as compared to what I said last night, we do plan to survey families at the middle school level because um, it's not—it's sort of a chicken or the egg. Like you have to have some model to talk to families so they can make a decision. But until you get the feedback from the families, you can't necessarily build out everything in the program. So, that was uh, our discussion today. At the high school level and summit, um, one of the things that, um, and I talked to you know the health department again today. One of the things we want to start planning is if metrics, if numbers get better, uh, and the the um, the health department uh, recommendations shift um, around the advisability of being in person at the high school level, making sure we have a program that's ready to roll and that we have information so that uh, we don't have to do the planning uh, immediately if we get that go ahead, but that we have an actual plan of what that would look like um, so that if if there's different recommendations made, uh, we're able to take some next steps uh, more more quickly and acutely on the high school piece. And I think, you know, that that's uh, the updates from 24 hours ago, I think, uh, from when we last spoke. I'm happy to answer any questions or just, you know, let, let, let the committee have dialogue. But I just thought it was important to be a little more explicit, perhaps, of all the work that goes into it and some of the challenges that we face uh, as we move forward to going to in-person, which I strongly endorse. Thank you for that detailed update. So the fire hose continues. <laughs> um, Mr. Menino, I see, a hand, I see your hand up. Did you answer Ms. Seeger's question? I did not. Sorry. So what I suggested last night was, um, and I've really started even today, we were looking at the survey, you know, so what we were thinking was early April, you know, by April 5th for the primary grades K to two. Um, I think the language we used was later in April uh, in the latest draft of the survey for grades three to six. And the reason we used um, the word later was that the feedback I received from the committee last night, granted you didn't vote, but I heard overwhelming feedback that, you know, if schools or grade levels are ready to go, that we, we don't necessarily have to have a specific date in mind. Um, so it wouldn't be the fifth, but it'd be later in April, uh, recognizing that some schools may have more staffing challenges than other other schools, but that you know there's an interest in as soon as we can getting K to six in buildings. Um, and at the secondary level, we were we were talking about late uh, April. Um, one information that's a little new is I think in Summit we think we maybe be able to be a little bit on the front end of that um, and get more students who are interested in Summit Academy, uh, which is located at the high school but its own unique day program. 
uh, in a, a bit sooner. It's a very small population of students. The students were already in, they were phase one students, and we feel like we can uh, move quicker given the size and scope of the building, uh, the school, and also the fact that staff, we already have experience with Summit Academy being in. Sorry, Ms. Seeger, for not looping back to your question sooner, but thank you, Mr. Menino, for reminding me of that. Mr. Demling. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up again that the, the parts of the MOA, uh, other than the metrics and phasing section, are all still in effect, because um, it, it has does have one significant impact on what we can do at the region level, because uh, the six foot uh, minimum distance is, is part of the um, MOA section that's continued to be valid. And that means that if everybody was back at the middle school and high school, that we could only fit about about half the kids that's so that's you know going back to july that's why our our model was was a hybrid however i'm wondering and this might be a bridge too far but you know i have to ask a question you know if if the yield of people that want to come back at the middle school and or the high school is 50 percent or less um it would seem like we could accommodate more days in person because we would have half the students um is that is that something that you think could be explored? Is that am I am I am I breaking the paradigm too much by <laughs> imagining that possibility? Or what are your, what are your initial thoughts on that? Um, so my initial thought is uh, it's the right question to ask. I think until we get the yield numbers, it's hard to answer definitively. And what I don't want to do is overpromise as we survey families um, or set up weird incentives where if fewer people want to come back, then more, there's more days. And then there's, I mean, just to be blunt, right, we, we, we could imagine some level of decision making process that feels less pure. Um, so I think you're right that if, if there was a lower yield, the potential to have more days in gets higher. But I, I don't want to advocate for that. I want families to make the decision they want to make. And I don't want to necessarily over promise to suggest that will happen, because I'd rather you know, under promise and then say, oh, well, actually only a third of families want to come in. We're now able to provide more uh, as opposed to going the other way, which I think will be really unsatisfying to families. Um, I think it also gets a little tricky in some of the elective courses at the secondary level, because once you start playing out what happens to elective courses and singleton courses in um, mixed models and um, staff members are with in-person students all the time. I worry about the impact that it would have on students who are in, um, in a remote model um, if there's not space in teacher schedules to actually teach both groups of students, right, on different days or things like that. So that's something that, you know, once we get the yield, we can take a look and see what happens with it. So I don't know if that's a satisfying answer, but I think mathematically it's it's where we are. Ms. Seeger. I would be really curious at the secondary level, especially for the middle school and during doing a survey, um, in asking parents, like, do they need to know about a model? Um, I think a lot of families are going to say, I want my kid in school, and everybody knows it's going to have to change. If you're staying remote, you might get, you're going to have a different, potentially, you may have different teachers. Like, it's just, each group is going to have an impact. And um, I know you could wait until you have a model of exactly what that looks like, but I suspect a lot of families might be like really strongly in one direction or the other. And so I'd be curious in a survey, a when you survey, if you asked about that, um, I don't know, like it's a thought that popped into my head because I, I feel like there's going to be changes either way. If you stay remote, if you come in person and how much does that matter to people right now? It does, right. And so I think that's right on. And that's that's something that uh, Principal Sharon and I talked about. And Tim Sheehan, our curriculum coordinator, is going to be kind of the central office lead working with him. He's, he's had a, uh, a good relationship, actually, particularly throughout the pandemic, um, being heavily involved in middle school work so that he has some central office support along with that. Uh, and Debbie Smolin as well. So there, there is exactly the question we're talking about is how do you word the questions that um, information where people can give an informed choice, but not uh, perhaps not over promising with specificity that we can't guarantee. So that's going to be our challenge. Um, like everything, it's going to be imperfect, but I think we're trying to be very realistic about that without um, compromising teacher privacy. And I think that's a really important thing uh, on our elementary survey. We also have added a question that really um, asks families not to be in touch with their child's teacher about whether their child will be in person or not. 
Um, that's a personal health related question. If families knew that, that would certainly affect their choice, right? Um, and so I, I feel it's, it's uh, I don't know if I feel bad is the right phrasing, but you know I know that's information that would be helpful and useful in making a choice about what families want to do. However, the primary, you know, the most important thing for me is the, the privacy for staff. And so I think people, the upside is people are really making a pure choice of whether they want the kid in person or not without any guarantee that either choice will, will yield the, the staff member that their children are currently working with. So, you know, it, it, it's perhaps imperfect, but I think the, the staff privacy is the most important piece of that. And we can't guarantee that there's continuity on either end of it, no matter what the, the family chooses. And Ms. Spitzer. Um, thanks. I also have a question kind of related to the survey and less so about, I, I totally agree with you that the decision to send your kid back or not is, is going to be a really difficult one. I'm more um, thinking about this question about transportation because I think it's, it sounds like it's as complex a, an issue in terms of your planning as some of the other things about who's going to be in which classroom. And so I understand you're probably going to need to know fairly early on who, who needs transportation and who doesn't. I'm just um, thinking especially about the elementary kids who um, who can't be left alone to get on the bus by themselves and things like that, and who may have you know siblings or parents who you know for now it's been easy because somebody stays at home and and but they're they're I'm just thinking they're going to need to know as much information as possible about the contours of like what time do I need to be available to help my kid get on the bus or what time do I need to be able to drop my kid off at the school and I'm just thinking you know like knowing as much as they can about the timing of the transportation requirements I know you won't be able to tell them what time the bus is going to swing by their door but you could hopefully know at the beginning what time a potential drop off or a potential pickup would have to happen, especially now that most parents don't have options for um, after school or the before school. Right. And then they also don't have options of like hiring somebody to help um, with uh, driving. I'm just thinking um, for my own family, I know this is one of the things that it would be really difficult to give a yes, no answer on the transportation question that's binding without knowing those level of details about the, the drop-offs and pickups. So to the extent possible, I think it would be really useful to give as much as possible. Yeah, I think I may under, uh, under uh, not meet the expect. but you're right. And um, it's really hard to do that. And we definitely include the start time and end times uh, of school. Uh, and that includes when you could drop off. But in terms of pickup from buses, uh, until we have bus routes, it's really hard to say. The bus routes are a lot shorter than they were in the past. Uh, with half the, roughly half the number of students um, doesn't quite mean the route is half as long, but the you know it is uh, quicker routes. Um, so I'll talk to Rupert before that survey goes out, but it may be that that's a really good Q and A that we have on Monday with families um, because I, I I hate to promise. Oh, I think the earliest pickup would be nine twenty five, and then it ends up not being, and people have made a decision that they no longer you know that it, it's just a little bit tricky. Um, uh, I'm always current, conscious of overpromising in these situations. I'm just a suggestion. Yeah, please. Potentially, I'm wondering if there might be a third option. So, like, yes, I can provide transportation. Definitely, no, I definitely will need you know my own transportation. And third, like, it will depend on the pickup time and drop off. Um, and then it might, because the worst thing would be is if you plan for a route. It, it, like you said, adding those five kids makes it really hard. But it seems like it would be easier to potentially take off some of those kids. Although I, I know that it's very costly, the transportation piece. So we'd want to be as conservative as possible for financial reasons, but. Yeah, let me let me see if I can work on it with Rupert tomorrow morning before the survey comes out. I mean, your points are really well, you know, really well taken. I'm just, uh, I'm a little bit bracing for, you know, the level of detail that people would want and my ability to deliver, um, you know, um, might be a little bit mixed. They're juxtaposed, I should say. Miss Kenny. Sorry, I lost my mouse there for a second. All right, I have a couple of questions that I think you have answered um, some of them, uh, but I just wanna make sure I got them out. So uh, the phase one students that were already planned for uh, in, in the fall planning, um, even though they were planned for and in theory could have been an immediate 
in, right? But because so many families have switched their feelings, which is absolutely fine, but it's making those, that planning kind of obsolete. Like it's not so much, back. yeah, it's not so much the phase one because there's, we had binding surveys and those families actually came in, right? The kids actually came in. It's much more the phase two and three families uh, where we didn't ever really get to a, a super, you know, they never came in and, and some people never filled out a binding survey. And the data source we have is our voluntary return classrooms, mm -hmm. where, you know, if you compare back what people have indicated now versus what indicated they indicated in the fall, there's a pretty significant difference. Um, it's actually, oddly enough, and it's a small sample size, but it's, it's roughly worked out to be an even number of students, but different students, right? Which for transportation, <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it makes a difference. So, so we'll see if that plays out, again, small sample size. But the phase one, we did see some variation. But it's much more the students who never um, came into the building um, and now have the opportunity versus via the voluntary return that we're seeing large changes. Okay, and then um, another question I had was, so when high school and middle school schedules were designed in the fall, they were designed with the thought that children were going back to being in person in school, right? So I'm a little confused as to why there's so much new scheduling has to be done for students that already had schedules that were designed for when they were going to be in person. Sure. So it's not so much the schedule of like when the classes are, it's really a nature of, um, we have some teachers who will be remote and some teacher who will be in person. And we also have some singleton courses where we have students who potentially would be both. So uh, I'll give a really tangible example. Let's say Mr. Harrington was teaching um, a drama class. And so, sorry, he's just in the middle of my square. I didn't mean to pick him. <laughs> um, and he's the only drama teacher in the school, right? And so he has, in a class, he has 20 students and 10 are remote, 10 choose remote and 10 choose in person. So all of a sudden, in another drama class, Mr. Harrington has another 20 students and the same phenomenon, like the best case scenario, 10 students choose remote and 10 choose, students choose in person. All of a sudden, there's a lot of students will radically changed because Mr. Harrington, Mr. Harrington will need uh, potentially a remote class and an in-person class. Uh, and so that's where, um, despite our best planning, it's not so much that the overall schedule needs to change, but individual student schedules do need to change so that Mr. Harrington can attend to his students who may be in front of him and, and may not be. Um, and then let's take it another step forward. So Mr. Harrington, um, yeah, I'm sorry, it's so, I shouldn't have picked you, but uh, Mr. Harrington <laughs> has, uh, you know, uh, I didn't, shouldn't have personalized it, but Mr. Harrington uh, has developed in the last couple months, you know, a medical condition and now can't be in person. Now we've got a whole bunch of students when they come in person who don't have access to a course that we have to fill with a different course. Drama is no longer accessible to them for in-person instruction. Uh, so then we have to look at their schedule and figure out who's going to teach those students who plan to come in person for drama, but that's no longer an option for them. Um, and so that's where we get into the complications. It's not at the writ large master schedule level, it's at the individual student level um, that it becomes a particularly significant challenge. Um, and so, and, and let's say I'm a student in Mr. Harrington's class and I stay remote. So my A period Mr. Harrington class is now my C period Mr. Harrington class. Well, I had Ms. Spitzer for math in C period. Now I've got to figure out when am I gonna get math? Otherwise I don't have math, I might just have drama and you know that's not what we're gonna do. So it's really the domino effect of uh, who comes in person, who doesn't. That means individual student schedules will have to change significantly. And then let's layer on top special ed services, ELL services and other services. Uh, and that's where it becomes an incredibly large puzzle to try to solve. So um, that's started to get like specific. And again, sorry for my Ms. Spitzer and Mr. Harrington examples, but um, I just wanted to paint that picture because it's when we're having parallel models and we're transitioning at the secondary level, any one change has a resulting change to the schedule. And, and maybe my C period class that was math, now Ms. Spitzer has to fill that with more students. Um, and it, it just ends up being a, a very, very complex puzzle to try to solve. Uh,
quickly. So, you know, the best thing we can do is figure out who can be in person, who needs to be remote from, a, from the teaching force for our core classes that everyone takes, and then work with them to reorganize, you know, structures and potentially teams so that all students get what they need, um, but easier said than done. Um, and until we know the yield of students, that's why it makes it very hard to put those schedules together. So just as a follow-up, so then the student schedules that they received in the fall would have ended up changing anyway when they were, because at the middle school, they started remote, right? right? And then at some point it was thought that they were going into person, in person. So those schedules that they got at the beginning of the year would have changed anyway. They would have, and that was some of the thinking between starting with one day and then two day would have given us an on-ramp to change more gradually, um, potentially, whereas um, we don't have the time for that. So it would be a much more acute and rapid change. Okay, and then I have one final question. Oh yeah, no, these, these are great questions. I don't mean to be, <laughs> if, if it's anything, my tiredness might be making me sound that I, uh, I hope I don't sound frustrated because I'm certainly not. These are excellent questions. No, 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 <laughs> I, I don't, I just feel like I've commandeered. Uh, anyway, so, um, the length of the day, um, they will be elementary and um, secondary middle school kids will have their full day, will have the day that they currently have. So like my family has an elementary kid and a middle school kid. So one will start at 845 and one will start at nine. And then so their their days will be the same as they currently are right now. So no. So what we agreed to, and this is in the MOA, was that um, the in-person days at the secondary level would start at nine o'clock and the elementary days would start at 945. Um, so if you go all the way back to our planning and what was voted, it, it did have shorter days to allow for better cleaning, ventilation, and teacher planning uh, around this. And some of that, frankly, is is we want to support teachers with more planning time. Some of it is practically if everyone has their prep at the beginning of the day, uh, it makes it much easier for staffing coverage, which is every single district's challenge right now. Uh, it's making sure they have the coverage to make it through the staffing day. Okay, so the the length of the day will be what was sent to Desi in August. Okay. Exactly. Yep. Yep. And that was okay, already previously you. agreed to by the MOA. Yep. So no, no problem. Yeah. I should have. There's a lot of details to this, and you know, <laughs> I feel like I talk too much when I'm presenting, and then I realize how many details there are that I'm not being explicit about. So my apologies. Uh, there's too many pieces and you can't remember all of them all at the same time. So <laughs> you're doing a good job. <laughs> Thanks. And um, don't worry about commandeering, uh, uh, Ms. Kenny. I think that the, you probably asked a lot of questions that are in a lot of people's minds. Um, I saw a lot of nodding heads in the on the screen um, and maybe at home too. So thank you. Ms. Seeger, I see your hand is up. Yeah. Uh, you definitely, Ms. Kitty, asked a lot of questions I had because um, I really wanted to drill into the detail around the high school, especially because honestly, I, I would really love to try to get kids in the school this year and, and see a focus on that. Um, and for both the middle school and maybe mostly the high school where there are a lot of these potential one-off courses and these snags that you'll run into with scheduling, um, I wonder if it's an option that you're considering, and I, I honestly, I wonder how parents and families would react to this, but for these classes that are one-off where you may not have a lot of options, um, is it acceptable that there be a place in the school where the kids can attend these classes remotely? Um, you know, sort of like what you have now with the students being in the school attending, um, I see that as a feasible option of like blending these styles. So with some, you have a remote teacher who teaches the singleton one class. Sorry, that's uh, redundant. But like, you know, you have that special class in Greek mythology that's taught by one person and they're remote. I, I think that would enable just, that, that could solve a lot of problems. Um, and I hope, you know, ideas like that are being explored because certainly at the, the high school level, these kids could handle that sort of schedule breakup, um, mm -hmm. especially if they'll be going off to college soon where they have to manage more of their own. Yeah, they yeah, and absolutely we have talked about that. It's, it's the challenges, where's the staffing come from? Because there still does need to be a supervision aspect. And there's also some courses where, like you thought of, a that's a great course example that you said where that would work really well. Uh, I think there's other scenarios where, you know, sometimes it's a little harder to, to, to make that work based on the space and, and, and other things. So. Um, but yeah, no, I think that's a really valid point. Um, and, you know, it's, um, 
I think what's a, a, another challenge that's particular to the high school is um, that, you know, grades matter in all of our schools and report cards, but grades really matter. So making the change I use of the example of Mr. Harrington and Ms. Spitzer, it would be hard at any grade level, but when we're making it in the last quarter of the school year, um, changing teachers makes it um, really hard. And, you know, you think about like some science courses, uh, we don't have that many sections, you know, of certain science courses. It's not just the singletons that we use some examples, but I think it's important to say we also have courses where there's two or three sections and there may not be the flexibility to move all over the place, especially in a block schedule where there's there's limited blocks, right? Um, and so, you know, I think that the level of complexity is significantly higher at the high school. And that's why you see a lot of high schools that are open using very similar models to what you described, Ms. Seeger, uh, which really um, some students really enjoy and come in, but there's a reason why the yield at high schools is so much lower than at the other grade levels. And some of it's because it's really hard to figure out a model that works to the same extent and to the same benefits, given the, the limitations, the logistical limitations of, you know, what this looks like at the high school level. But I think your, your example is something we look at and it also highlights uh, some of the limits um, that to trying to organize a hybrid schedule at a high school would have. So I guess uh, so building on, on the, the two lines of questioning um, that staying on the high school, um, so what does that mean in terms of, you, you mentioned that a survey for middle school will be going out um, hopefully in the, within the next couple of weeks set to inform the model development. What is what is the timeline? And I, I you mentioned sort of late April for secondary. Um, what is the timeline and, and what does that sort of surveying look like for, for high school students? Yeah, I think we really need more time to build out the model. You know, the more we've dug into it, the more complex it's gotten, particularly the lateness of the school year at the high school level, which I know is a sore point for many people. And I, I get it, I understand it. But the reality is the stakes are really high and making full scale changes to schedules in the last month and a half of a high school year, um, you know, has some major implications. And I think, you know, as you know, as you know, we're in a block schedule this year because of COVID, but that also creates some additional complications because it may be that one biology teacher is teaching, you know, a set of courses in the fall and a different set in the spring. So there may not be another teacher teaching the same course in a different block at the high school. So, you know, what a lot of the high school programs look like are very similar to what Miss, you know, uh, what was described by Miss Seeger. So our team needs a little bit more time uh, to develop more of what that would look like um, and get back to you. I don't think we're at the place of surveying students quite yet. I don't think we have as much clarity on the model um, given the time of year. Mr. Demley. So let me ask you a question that might be too specific to answer, but um, I want to kind of push the, hone it a little bit, just the t ticking clock in the back of my head, right? Um, so do you, do you, based on what we were just talking about there, um, is, do you think a date like April 26th, right, which is seven and a half weeks from now, uh, is, do you think that's completely unrealistic and unachievable regardless of the model that is ultimately chosen for the for the high school return? No, I don't think it's completely unreasonable. I think it's just going to be a, you know, I think what high schools are finding is the models aren't meeting the expectations or satisfaction of many families and students because of the limitations that we've been talking about the last 10, 15 minutes. Um, so I think as long as the scale is right, I don't think it's um, necessarily unreasonable. I just, and I think once you get much later than that, uh, late April, early May, it starts begging some other questions, right? You know, at that point, you're getting really close to, to where students start thinking about finals period. And, you know, you've got seniors who frankly don't have that much more time in the school altogether because of the nature in Massachusetts of how early seniors can stop coming to school. Um, different topic for a different day perhaps, but um, uh, I'm from New York. We went to the last day, like it or not, so it's a little different model. Um, but um, so I, you know, I don't think it's necessarily unreasonable. I think it just may be unsatisfying in terms of the model that's developed. Um, you know, and I, I hate to set low expectations, but I think all the complications that, you know, the questions have elicited, you know, create a model that, you know, is it doable? Yeah, other districts have done it. Um, for some students, they may say, is it worth the, on the balance, if they're changing their full schedule, having a set of new teachers 
a month and a half away from finals, that's going to be a barrier. And uh, I think it's an open question about the cost benefit. And that's one that families can, can weigh, but you know, I want to, and again, I know this isn't going to be popular opinion, um, but if I'm a high school student and uh, my teachers, you know, significant number of my teachers change uh, on April 26th, that's hard. Right. And that's true if you come back or if you're remote necessarily, you know, that's a really hard thing. And for our students who are, we have many students who are highly grade conscious and concerned about GPA and implications and future, um, th that feels a little risky to many of our students. I think it will feel a little risky. And I'm not trying to minimize the, the positive impact of in-person for high school students. Like we have students who are really struggling, but I just want to right set the expectation that some of those challenges won't necessarily be resolved uh, by a program that we, we we potentially be able to offer, you know, mitigated perhaps. Um, and I'm not trying to talk you out of uh, asking our team to work on it, but but I, I just it's at the high school level, you know, it's not particularly school. You see a lot of schools doing like a eight to one and the bag lunch on the way out kind of thing, and you know, a lot of it's in the model that Miss um, that Miss Seeger described. You know, I, I, I'm not sure. You know, for some students that make may make a world of difference. For other students, it, the benefits may be a little more limited. Um, so, you know, and the reality is we have a number of staff members at all of our schools who have legitimate medical conditions and won't be coming in. Uh, and so, uh, well, we can't say who those people are. There are a significant number. Uh, and that, that may influence, you know, students' experiences throughout. I see a couple of raised hands, but I, my question kind of relates to Mr. Demling's prior question, which is, is there, is this overcomplicating it or does it add some flexibility there to, to sort of have a middle, middle step to when sort of you're developing the model that might be actual hybrid instruction? Um, is there, a, a th and, and then there's full remote, is there a third option that I don't want to disrupt my schedule, but I want to be in school. Can I sign up for just the distance learning center? Um, and and sort of choose that as a way to sort of be in the middle um, because it it because I agree it, it's a really really big choice and big decision to require those that want in person opportunities to agree to disrupt their schedule that much um, and maybe that sort of in between step might be acceptable is that does that complicate things to sort of offer that as a third way it's just hard to staff. Yeah. Uh, right, all of this comes down to staffing uh, and the challenges we have with that. And this may be, um, I don't know how the committee feels, <laughs> nor how my high school team feels, but it may be a really good conversation next week when our high school team's here to talk about the block schedule. While that's forward looking, it actually plays into a lot of the questions and comments we have, and it might actually give our team a little bit of time, uh, people who are much more intricate with some of these complications, to be able to, to meet with the regional school committee next week, because they'll be here anyway. To be able to talk through some of the limitations and some ideas that we have. Um, so I don't know how the committee feels about that, but I feel like I'm answering some of the questions. But I, I know that um, you know Principal Sadiq and you know Assistant Principals Gramacki and Camera, uh, they're they're dramatically more in the weeds uh, of understanding all of these complexities, and I think might be able to engage you at a, at a deeper level than what I'm. I feel like my capacity is. That's a great great suggestion. Thank you. Um, so um, Miss Stancer. Um, so I want to go to a little di bit different place. So last night there was some discussion about some non-academic activities. Um, I think drama was mentioned. I know there have been some questions about some kind of way to do music in person, things that are extracurricular. And I believe we also mentioned perhaps that there would be some inequities because there are students who would not be able to get to the school who would want to do that and really benefit from that. Is there any thought or any possibility of providing some transportation? Yeah, so we talked about that. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. So I think we talked about that a little bit today. And, and I think this is where it's much like Ms. McDonald's perspective as well. If we knew that that was our focus, and we weren't going to run other buses to the high school for other things. We probably could could produce uh, some, you know, transportation for families who need it. You know, at some central pickup sites, particularly areas uh, where there um, there's a higher density of families who would rely on buses. That's mm -hmm. what we're going to do it. I think our challenge is if we're running 
school for K to 12, and then we're adding additional bus routes uh, towards the end of the day that are bringing students as well as the buses going back to take students back to their home and then coming back to do elementary runs and then coming back to pick up students at the high school and drop them off. That's where it gets um, beyond our capacity. So I think, you know, again, next week, maybe we can get a little closer to decide, making a decision of where we, what eggs, what baskets we want to put our limited number of eggs in. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Cause I think you're right. That's we are concerned about that inequity. Um, you know, I will say that somehow students get home who are in, we have a late bus, but you know, our athletics run well beyond the late bus and, and somehow students always get home. Right. Um, and so I think getting to school would be the larger challenge as opposed to getting to home. Um, but, you know, again, it, it's sort of like, you know, we have capacity to do some of those things. I don't think we have a capacity logistically and, and for transportation to do all of those things. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Demling. Yeah. So, um, so just further on this idea of, um, you know, what kind of model could we produce for the high school when, and then what are the trade-offs, right? I'm just trying to get the, I'm in question mode, right? So I'm just trying to get the trade-offs here. And so when we think about, you know, okay, in seven and a half weeks, we could develop a certain model that may not be very satisfying to a number of students. My, my, my thought is, my, so the question that comes to mind is, well, would that be significantly changed in nine and a half weeks or 10 and a half weeks or from now, right? In other words, is there any benefit to continuing to plan and continuing to plan if, if there is at the end of the day, kind of a max out for satisfaction level. And then if there is, um, then it, it may help to, to communicate what that is, right? We wanna be honest and set people's expectations cor correctly um, and so that they can make most informed decision ahead of time. Uh, and, and if it's not gonna be satisfying for those students, um, one would, you know, e expect those families and students to, to opt out, right? So they wouldn't be going into that model. Now, obviously it's projection. And then once you get there, maybe right. you're not as satisfied as what you thought it was gonna be, you know, clearly, right? Um, but, but you know, if we're, if we're describing it as accurately and clearly as possible, this is what it's going to be, then, then you know, the trade-off could be we could get there sooner. And, and right. the whole reason I bring this up is that, and, you know, we heard this in public comment. I know that doesn't represent everybody, um, but I'm, I'm hearing a lot about the sooner the better, right? Mm -hmm. And that, like, that, that we understand it, it, it's not going to be this, you know, perfectly staffed um in-person experience. Maybe not all parents have that expectation, but I certainly understand that limitation. Um, but but I'm, I'm hearing it from, from a time point of view. And this idea a couple of speakers ago about, um, you know, trying to trying to meet the needs of, the, of, of, of those, those groups and, and particularly the students who are really struggling with isolation and, and who may really benefit, even if we can't, you know, right. pause there, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, I mean, I think one thing to clarify is that when we, and it's probably my mistake in the language I've used, but when you think about clubs, there's clubs on a wide range of topics. It's not just athletics, music, and theater and art, right? We have, we have very academically, uh, traditionally academically minded uh, clubs as well that run the gamut. Um, there's a tremendous number. I don't know the number off my head. A couple of you were here a couple of years ago where Miss Haygood went over um, the number of clubs and activities that occur at the high school and it's dizzying. Um, so I just, first of all, I want to clarify, I should have mentioned it before, that, that it really is uh, a wide range of clubs. I think in terms of uh, your question, I think that's right, Peter. I think, um, I think the sooner we can get to a place where students have um, social interactions, whether that's during the academic day, whether that's clubs, I think at a core level, that's, we want to get there sooner as opposed to later. And I think the calculus of would we do we think it's more important for students to have that opportunity sooner even if it sort of quote unquote doesn't get to the level that we want if we took more time to plan i think that's exactly the conversation that i had today with the high school administrative team when we were collecting and talking about the feedback that that, we, that i received last night and i think most of them watched if not all of them um on the the meeting last night so I think that's that's like the key question is where do we get the most bang for buck? And by bang, I mean you know the impact on the isolation that that we're that students are feeling. Um, so again, I, I think if we can come back to it, and I'm not trying to punt right now. If there's more questions about, it, I can. But I think it'd be really dynamic conversation to have um, Sam Talib and Mickey 
uh, be able to engage um, you all in the conversation. They, they both know the limitations more as well as just know high school students at a, at a much deeper level than I do. And um, certainly understand and hear from families and students about how they're doing. They see students who are doing well and students who are really struggling with this model. Um, but, you know, I think, I think you're right that probably the, the urgency is um, if we take too long to plan, uh, whatever the plan is, if it happens too late, probably, you know, just the limitations of the school year ending on June 20 something, uh, there, there's really, and, and re realistically at the high school level with exams and stuff, it ends more or less a week earlier than that um, because the last couple of days are exams and, and other pieces. I, I think that's a really important vantage point to go in. And I'd rather, you know, have a, a, a clear way for students to receive those interactions if they so choose um, and do that sooner as opposed to taking a tremendous amount of time to plan something that ends up yielding five or six weeks of in reality, you know? Um, so that was a really helpful reframe. Thank you. Are there other questions? I'm not seeing any right now. Um, so I'm going to, um, Ms. Lord circulated the, the draft motion for consideration and I put it, I do have it in a document somewhere that I will share so we can take a look at that together. Um, sorry. Okay. It was hiding. Can you folks see the, the motion on the screen? Good. Um, so as mentioned, um, um, Ms. Lord uh, drafted this with um, and uh, together with me. <laughs> um, and we shared and uh, shared this with the committee over the weekend. Um, so um, I will read it out loud. Um, the school committee directs the superintendent to develop and implement a plan for the return of in-person learning for all students who want it beginning in April 2021. The superintendent will manage this return and any shift back to remote learning based on a continuous assessment of health conditions in direct consultation with local public health officials. So we've learned a lot um, since, uh, since we first drafted this motion. We've had a lot of conversation. Um, uh, and and I don't know that anybody's made the motion yet, so um, that's obviously an option. Um, or we can discuss if we want to make any tweaks to this as a group before we make a motion. Uh, sorry, I have to move my screen. I see Miss um, Stancer, and then Miss Demley. Um, I just. Uh... I want to, the beginning in April 2021, we have talked about if, if, and I think last night, particularly Pelham Elementary was mentioned, if, if a school is ready before that, um, seemed like people thought it would be fine to go back before this date. So in making this motion, are we restricting it to April 2021? Did, um, I don't, I wouldn't see it as a restriction, but we could say, we could say no later than April, 2020. Um, Mr. Demling? Yeah, I have a, so I, I like this motion. I, I, I support it. I have a, um, I have a proposed change, um, but it, that it encompasses what Ms. Stanter is, is talking about, uh, but it has some other changes as well. Um, I don't know if it makes sense to, um, to, to, try and articulate it now or whether to pass it or propose it as an amendment. Um, doesn't seem like there's a lot of opinion on that. Um, so <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll just read what out loud um, and um, what, what, I, what I'd like to propose we change. So basically the, keep the whole motion the same and I, I, I just uh, replacing 
that last beginning in April 2021 section and basically expanding it to say what the dates and the grades are. And so, um, so we would so the full sentence would read: The school committee directs the superintendent to develop and implement a plan for the return of in-person learning for all students who want it. Without, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, for all students who want it with grades K to two returning by April 5th, grades three to six returning by April 12th, and grades seven to 12 returning by April 26th, 2021 as practical and feasible. I can um, put it in the chat if you're trying to copy and paste there, um, Ms. McDonald. And just, just to briefly like explain why, um, I think, you know, like I really I think we've had a great discussion tonight about pace and you know one thing I think is important um, for me to express to the community is is I think this superintendent the school committee and um, and the vast majority of the public is on board with the idea that once once it seems once it's deemed safe once a class a grade is deemed safe we want this to happen as fast as possible nobody nobody has a vested interest in slowing this slowing this down you know any any more than than, than it does or isn't isn't working towards that goal. It's all about how do we do this in the most responsible manner? How do we balance right pace versus versus design quality and whatnot? Um, you know, I'll just say directly, I, I don't agree with the suggestion that the superintendent doesn't want to expedite this. I've been very impressed with how much planning the superintendent has brought in, given that so far the school committee has done nothing. <laughs> and this is all of this planning and all of the details that Dr. Morris um, uh, went through is all because of what's happened in the news, right? And just really proactively trying to be. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, and and uh, you know, and uh, it, it's for all the reasons that, that Dr. Morris went through. There, there is this gap, right, between um, the decision point, which would be tonight, and the uh, arrival point of when kids actually get in the buildings, which is four to seven weeks from now. And obviously, conditions can change right between net now and then and so um we heard dr morris talk about um what the local health public health officials concerns were about the high school return um that may change in the coming weeks you know who knows what that's going to be seven weeks from now um and uh you know one way or the other and um i i think uh the the advantage of planning with the as if the students are going back and they're going back in april um, for, for the region is that we do all that planning now, we get that survey, the transportation, all that stuff that Dr. Morris talked about. And then if we get to that date and the health conditions are still not appropriate for it to happen, well, then we've spent a lot of planning time that didn't come to fruition. And we've, we've you know, there's going to be some sad parents and students um, and that is a cost, but, but if the conditions have um, turned favorable, then we're ready to go, right? And and that's what we're really trying to achieve, particularly at this juncture of the um, of the school year, where there is um, uh, uh, you know so little time left. Um, so that that's the basic idea with this. Um, you know, as for the specifics, I, I I think this is a really important communications document for the public. I think it's going to get shared and quoted and put in the news stories and whatnot. And as much as we want to put press releases out, you know, this is this is going to get attention. So I think putting dates to grades helps. Um, I think I think the the April fifth reflects what we've already heard um, from from Dr. Morris that putting by April fifth means that hey, if Pelham's ready to go earlier, then have at it, right? Um, April twelfth we talked about as as really the only issue being possible inequitable staffing across the buildings, and and we've already heard feedback about that. Um, and then, you know, as far as the 26, you know, we just had a robust discussion about that. And I'm, I'm open to, to input from the superintendent if he thinks that any of these dates are wildly unrealistic or if he feels like they could be moved up further. You know, um, I just think that if we, as a school committee, are sort of setting an, a kind of an aggressive schedule um, in, based on all the practical implementation steps and based on all that model stuff that has to be worked out at the region, um, it's 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 a good thing to to march towards. So I'll stop there. Miss Stancer. Uh, Mr. Demling, I have a question. Um, I, I agree with this, but when you say as practical and feasible, are you referring only to grades seven through twelve? 
And if you're referring to everybody, I think there should be a comma after April 26th. I will take that as a friendly amendment. And yes, you're correct. <laughs> Ms. Seeger. I was thinking, um, as Mr. Demling mentioned, April 26th for the middle school, uh, I see these as these types of planning, maybe not on uh, Dr. Morris's part, because I'm sure you're involved in all of it, um, but as these are, these are parallel planning things that can happen to the K through six and the seven through 12, where you have the administration, uh, the principals, working on their different plans with the different groups is is it now um it's march 3rd so that gives almost two months to try to plan for the seven and eight to return is can that be condensed or it, i know there are bus things I, I just i know a lot of this can happen in parallel um in terms of planning so is april 26 it can that be condensed at all can that be brought back to like the 12th or is that practical or is that not? Dr. Morris. So the way I read the motion is uh, returning by as a latest possible date, not a specific date of return. Um, so maybe I'm misunderstanding the motion, but I think the idea would be that it would be no later than would be another way to say perhaps the same thing uh, more than if we were ready on April 12th that we would not need to come back and say hey we're ready early you know it's much more uh, setting sort of like you know no later than dates than setting specific exact dates uh, you know i think that was consistent with what i've heard from the committee the last two nights is that you know it's as soon as practicable um and that uh, you know i understood these dates to be a no later than kind of variety it, just a, a follow up to that. Yeah, no, that that's how I understand them too. I'm just wondering in terms of practicality for the the seventh and eighth, um, in terms of bringing so, them back. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it will depend on the survey results and what we find and how many students want to come back. Um, you know, I, I do want to note that it looks like the twelfth and the twenty sixth are really far apart, but one of those weeks is uh, break week, uh, and then there's no school on April second, I believe, is Good Friday. Uh, so, so some of these dates look like they're further away than they actually are in terms of work days uh, for or school days, you know, whether it be virtual or in person. So, you know, I think I think April 26th feels a date I'm comfortable, you know, in my conversation with Principal Sharon, and we hope we can push the envelope uh, as much as we can. But I, I do, you know, he's got a number of teachers already who have watched the meeting last night and got in touch with them already, but I want to be in a planning group to see, you know, that they're, you know, and we want to take advantage and have the best product. So if it ends up starting on the 26th instead of the 12th, which is a one week school difference, but we feel like um, we're more ready to go. I, I would, I get the urgency and support the urgency. And I, I think, you know, again, uh, you can go too far down this and I, I don't, you know, I know I've been criticized and that's okay for saying that, but uh, I think it's a reasonable amount of time to plan the model and then do all the work uh, for staff members, especially if there's large shifts of students between teachers or across teams, so there's new teams formed um, to make sure that we're, we're providing uh, academically, not just the safety component, but uh, academically we're providing the supports that students need and communication between teachers to make that work efficiently and effectively. If people were just going back to the same teachers and it was a different setting, we could do this a lot quicker, but we, we know that's not going to be the case for, for many students. Yeah, um, Dr. Morris, you're reminding me of a question that um, uh, I received from a community member and I did correct it to ask it earlier. Um, I think I know the answer, but I, I'm going to ask it so that everybody in the community can hear the answer, which is, um, is there a potential or an opportunity to move the date up by moving April vacation to earlier? So, um, hmm, let's say this. I am not one of these people, but there are people, our staff members and families who have made some level of plans over that break. You know, I would hope those plans stay within Massachusetts or, you know, but there's, you know, there are people who may have commitments that week. Um, and so I want to be a little cautious. 
about that. It's certainly something that would, you know, I would recommend if, if the group wanted to do it to engage our bargaining units who uh, have members who have made commitments that way. I know we adjusted things last year. That was a little different when we were all in remote. Um, but I also sort of wonder about, uh, I'll say this differently. Um, I think you're asking if we had school during April break, if like April break was shortened and, and is that where you're sort of getting at? The question was if, if they were, if we moved April break so that we were in school during that week so that those after break start dates, back in school dates might be earlier. Right. So, you know, I, I would have concerns about staff members who already have, you know, some level of plans. Um, I worry about families who have already put down deposits on camps and other activities for their children, and maybe some would be fine with it, but there'd be a lot of money eaten, I think. Uh, I know there's a lot of outdoor camps that uh, have propped up over April break um, that, you know, wouldn't necessarily give you your money back if slots are given. Um, so I think there are staffing concerns. You know, it's certainly something that if the committee wanted to, we could engage our bargaining units, not just one, but all of our bargaining units uh, on that shift and, and maybe understand from families. Um, but there's also a lot of facilities work that's being planned for that week in terms of tents going up and, and many things that we actually need students not to be there to do. Uh, tents is being the, the primary example that I'm thinking of that we don't want to put them up too early. You know, if you think of a couple of days ago, a lot of those tents would have been significantly damaged in the windstorm we had. If we get into mid-April, that's what the facilities department feels like. It's not going to snow anymore, and we're less likely to have those kind of storms that happen late March, early April. Um, and, you know, they're full-time with students being in, focused on that. And so, you know, Monday has to be off. It's a state holiday. Um Okay. You can tell I'm sort of ambivalent about it, um, but you know, if certainly if you want to engage the bargaining units, that would be the first step. I'll put it that way. That maybe I should have just said that. I think that's a, a thorough answer to the question. <laughs> it's not surprising to me. Um, so uh, the original motion is above the at the top of the page, and the proposed revision is is um, is here. Um, I wasn't sure. I thought that I heard that everybody feels like the by April 5th, by April 12th, by 26th is sufficient in terms of saying that it could be sooner, but no later than. Um, so I don't know that not hearing moves to change that phrasing, um, but uh, Ms. Seeger. Yeah, does that leave the flexibility? It sounds like it does. I just want to confirm this, that if Pelham is ready to go and Amherst isn't, that Pelham can do their thing. Yeah, okay. I'm seeing head nodding, so. Yeah, and I and I would ask the same also of individual elementary schools within Amherst as well, that an individual school, if it's ready sooner, could also go sooner, is how I read that. Okay. Any other thoughts, um, Mr. Demling? Yeah, I just wanted to point out because we've had, we spent so much on the top sentence that I didn't want the, what the bottom sentence uh, get second billing. And this is a really important shift for us for the school committee, uh, and it it reflects the exact same approach that we've taken for the fall. Um, that we are, you know, this the you know March third, twenty twenty one. This is the end of automatic. You know, assuming this motion passes. This is the end of automatic metrics in, in Amherst Regional Public Schools. And we are shifting to a mode where instead of us, you know, trying to define or negotiate or, or otherwise construct some automated, balanced, static way to, to open and close the schools, we are, we are putting the authority squarely in the hands of the superintendent and directing him to uh, consult directly with local public health officials and make a continuous assessment of health health conditions and it has its its pros and its cons right like the one of the pros is that we are decoupled from a static definition in time that we either decide or that we agree to and that gives us more flexibility and um you know based on the discussions we've we've had the last couple nights you know that that we feel that that is most most effective on the other hand you know it might not always be exactly what we individually want as a committee right like uh, if you know if if you asked individual committee members tonight, um, we may have a different opinion on um, on the, the pace uh, or the return of like the high school, for example, than 
then public health officials may. And, and that's, that's going to be a piece of input. The superintendent will have to balance our, our input, right? And we in, in the public's input uh, and the recommendation of, of public health officials, those guidelines that are ever evolving. And so it, it, it's a higher bar, I think. It's a higher ask for the superintendent. Um, but I, I think based on our experience, it's, it's the right one. And I'm, 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 I'm happy that we're making that change tonight uh, and, the, and that we have the same change for the fall. Thank you, that, that's an important point. Um, I agree. Okay. Um, well, I will, um, seeing no more questions, um, before I, I'll, I'll start the motion making, but I, I want to repeat what I, what some of, and recap a little bit of what we talked about last night, just for folks that are tuning in just now, I think, um, you know, the reason why we're doing this, there's there's multiple reasons. And when we talked last night, each of us um, and each of this, this group shared different reasons for why we each were in, in support of it. And, and I think that's important to note is that we're all coming at this from, um, from our own um, perspective, our own experience and our own analysis of the situation. Um, but I think generally across the board, there's multiple reasons um, that we that we share. I, I think you know shared understanding um, and and commitment that and uh, that our students are are suffering academically and emotionally. Their physical and mental health is being is challenged um, in this extended remote environment, and their families are struggling. And we hear that repeatedly. Um, the desperation in the in the public comment from those that are speaking up to us. We also all shared and agreed that we are prepared and we hear that also from the community. They've understood that we have the space, we have the ventilation, um, we have the PPE and the protocols in place. We're, we're ready um, to make this move. Um, we're not constrained, um, as, as Mr. Demling also just pointed out, we're shifting the decision-making um, on this over to the superintendent um, in consultation with public health officials. Um, and we will, it's very likely, um, I, I think the meeting, the meeting now is officially on, or the topic is officially on the agenda for the Board of Education on Friday afternoon. Um, it's, it's quite likely that we'll be required to do so by the state. And so I think all, all of those reasons, there's, there's nuances and, and slightly different reasons that each of us stated last night. But I think um, it's, it's safe to say that the, the committee is, is, was pretty clear in sort of the reasons why we're considering this motion tonight. Um, and, I, and I think that that's really important to say. I think it's also really important for the community to hear us sort of restate our commitment to our students and the education and well-being of our students. That is our mission. Um, and, and so that's why I'm saying it again tonight, that that is at the forefront of the decision making that we're making as, it, as, um, as the three committees. Um, and so with that, I'm going to move that the regional school committee direct the superintendent to develop and implement a plan for the return of in-person learning for all students who want it. With grades K through two returning by April 5, grades three through six returning by April 12th, and grades seven through 12 returning by April 26 as practical and feasible, the superintendent will manage this return and any shift back to remote learning based on a continuous assessment of health conditions and direct consultation with local public health officials. Is our second. Second. Moved by McDonald and second by Harrington. Is there any further discussion from the region? Seeing none, we'll move to a roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. I think you were on mute, Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye, and McDonald, aye. The motion passes the region uh, unanimous nine to zero. 
Chair Hall, would you like to? Sure. Um, I'll move that the Pelham School Committee directs the superintendent to develop and implement a plan for the return of in-person learning for all students who want it with grades K through two returning by April 5th, grades three through six returning by April 12th, and grades seven through 12 returning by April 26th as practical and feasible. The superintendent will manage this return and any shift back to remote learning based on a continuous assessment of health conditions. Oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> direct consultation with local public health officials. Is there a second? Second. second. Oh, all right. I heard Ron first. Moved by Hall, seconded by Menino. Any further discussion? No. All right. I'll do a roll call vote. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Stancer? Stancer, aye. Ms. Barlow? Barlow, aye. Mr. Menino? Menino, aye. And Hall, I. The motion passes unanimously in Pelham. Uh, I would um, like likewise make a motion for the Amherst School Committee that the Amherst School Committee direct the superintendent to develop and implement a plan for the return of in-person learning for all students who want it with grades K through two returning by April 5, 5th, grades three through six returning by April 12th, in grades seven through 12, returning by April 26 as practical and feasible. The superintendent will manage this return and any shift back to remote learning based on a continuous assessment of health conditions in direct consultation with local public health officials. Is there a second? Lord, second. Moved by McDonald, second by Lord. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll move to roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. Motion passes Amherst unanimously five to zero. And after I stop presenting, I will share that with uh, Superintendent for inclusion in the surveys tomorrow. Thank you, everybody. And I will now move to adjourn the Amherst School Committee. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Spitzer, uh, moved by McDonald, second by Spitzer. Um, there is no discussion. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The Amherst School Committee is adjourned. Chair Hall. All right, I move to adjourn the Pelham School Committee. Is there a second? Second. Stancer, second. All right, moved by Hall, seconded by Stancer. Uh, roll call vote, Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Ms. Barlow. Barlow, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. And Hall, aye. Pelham is adjourned. Okay, and I think mm -hmm. that's it. So all right am i up you are now up chair demling okay uh seeing the presence of a quorum i'll call this meeting to order of the union 26 school committee and take a brief roll call vote miss mcdonald i'm sorry roll call attendance miss mcdonald mcdonald present uh miss spitzer spitzer present uh miss hall hall present mr menino Medina present. Uh, Ms. Stancer? Stancer present. And Ms. Kenny? No. Sorry. One, two, three. Is that it? Yeah. Sorry, it's late. <laughs> it's late in my mind. And definitely present. Um, Union 26 is, um, is called to order. And I will move that the Union 26 school committee enter into executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for contract negotiations with non-union personnel, Superintendent Michael Morris with no intention of returning to open session. Is there a second? Second. Um, who was that? That was me. That was Hall. Oh. <laughs> you manage this much better than I do. Sorry, I don't know. That was me. I don't know why I said that. I second it. Moved by Demling, seconded by Hall. Uh, roll call vote, Ms. Hall. Um, Hall, aye. Um, Mr. Benino. 
company, you know why. Uh, Ms. Dancer. Dancer, aye. Uh, Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. McDonald. And now I will move that the Regional School Committee enter into executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for contract negotiations with non-union personnel. Superintendent Michael Morris with no intention of returning to open session. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald and seconded by Spitzer. We'll take a roll call vote. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Dancer. Dancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Looks like uh, Mr. Sullivan says aye, and McDonald's aye. So the region is now in executive session. <laughs>